The desire of Titus Women is to invite women around the world to know Jesus as their Savior, Center, and Source. May God guide and encourage you through this message by Beth Coppage. I'd like to begin today, if you would look in 1 Peter, and, I'm go- and we're going to read from 13. Verse 13, chapter 1, verse 13. Therefore, now I'm reading from the um, New King James Version, but I'm going to read it a little bit from a couple translations. So just hold steady and just let, let's see if God can say it to us in a new way. Therefore, gird up the loins of your mind, be sober, and rest your hope fully on the grace that is to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. As obedient children, not conforming yourselves to the former lusts as in your ignorance, but as he who has called you is holy, so also be holy in all your conduct. Because it is written, Be holy, for I am holy. And if you call on the Father, who without partiality judges according to each one's work, conduct yourselves throughout the time of your stay here in fear, knowing that you were not redeemed with corruptible things like silver or gold from your empty conduct received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Jesus Christ as a lamb without blemish and without spot. He indeed was foreordained before the foundation of the world, but was manifest in these last times for you who through him believe in God, who raised him from the dead and gave him glory so that your faith and hope are in God. And we're going to stop there. Now I'd like to read the first couple verses from a couple different translations. Let your minds, this is NIV, let your minds be ready for work. No, it's not any of it either. It's let your minds re- be ready for work. Be well balanced, placing your hope totally on the grace that will be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. This is NIV. Therefore, prepare your minds for action. Be self-controlled. Set your hope fully on the grace to be given when Jesus Christ is revealed. Dear Lord Jesus, we just praise you this morning for the privilege of meeting together in your, at your feet. Sisters, sisters at the feet of Jesus. And Lord, we ask today that you might come, dear Lord Jesus, and teach us. And Father, just as you taught the two disciples on the Maus Road, we pray today you might come and open the word to our hearts that First Peter might live and that, Lord, you might make us women after God's own heart. We lift to you today Pat and her family, and we lift Thailand. We lift every need they have, and we pray for an encouragement from the Holy Spirit, and we pray for every financial need for this new semester to be granted. Lord, we ask Jesus for the whole church in Thailand. We ask for a revival of the Spirit of God and that the work of God would go on. Lord, we ask too for the Dupree's as they get ready to go to Japan. Lord, let us be faithful to pray and intercede. And as they weigh just where they, sh- what part of the ministry you have for them. Lord, I being in the way the Lord led me, let them know your will. And Jesus for Jamie. And Mark and the four children as they're on the front line in Korea. We ask today that there would be encouragement in the Holy Ghost. And Lord, you would make us as women intercessors. Lay the world on our heart. Take us out of us, our us, us for no more mentality. And Lord, teach us how to intercede. We just pray in Jesus' name. And we thank you now for what you're going to do. We wait expectantly for what you have to say to us. Create in me a clean heart, dear Lord Jesus. And we let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable to you. In Jesus' name, amen. There may be some of you this week that have been trying very hard to um, 
have sensed a eagerness in your own heart as you face the new year that you wanted God to do something more for you. And this may have been one of the hardest first weeks that you've had in a new year in a long time. I have a word for you. If there is in, in you any eagerness to give God the glory, there will be a fight. If then, then the, if that eagerness is turned to action, have any of you tried to have your devos with consistency this week? And has it turned, if there's any eagerness and that eagerness is turned to action, then there is trouble. <laughs> and blocks begin to rise and and doors everywhere and there and there is no way out and what seemed like a hill suddenly becomes a mountain we will give ourselves to prayer and every imaginable and unimaginable thing pressed us bodily weariness tired spirit penitent feelings mosquitoes and living lively enemies to prayer but a cry will bring Jesus down, and that is all that we could do. Their cry went up, and Jesus came down. If you and I begin to really get serious about walking with Jesus Christ, doing our Bible study, having time in the Word on a daily basis, seeking to pray, seeking to pray for our missionaries in the world, do you know what will happen? There will be incredible obstacles that will be thrown in your path. These, the, this was from an Amy Carmichael book and the, this was India and it was summer and there were mosquitoes. It may not be mosquitoes. It will be the kids will have a fight. The phone will ring. People will drop in. You suddenly will think, I don't want to read the word. I don't like the word. I don't want anything to do with the word. You name it, it will happen. Do not be discouraged. And if you cannot get through on your own, you call a friend, you call your small group leader, you call me and say, would you pray for me? Because I am trying to go through with God and I am having blocks. And that's where we need each other. We need each other. So don't be discouraged this week. Just keep pressing on. Because the best is yet to come. Prayer can make all the difference. And if you cannot do it by yourself, call somebody and say, pray with me. Now remember last week, that it's, we looked at what it means to really know Jesus Christ. And the whole book of 1 Peter is a call to holiness. That you and I would become a holy people. A people after God's own heart. Now how do we become holy? And last week they lay, Peter laid the foundation. The first prerequisite for a holy heart is that you and I must know that we're born again. That we have to be saved. That we have to know that we know him. Now, how did, what did he spell this out? And he spelled it out in a beautiful way. He said that, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has made us so that we are born again to a living hope. And the living hope is that Jesus is coming back again. And that hope is established by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. So that we are a people that when we know him on a personal basis and are born again, we have a living hope. Then we have an inheritance in heaven. What is our inheritance? Is it one that passes away? No. It's unfading. It's incorruptible. It is a pure inheritance. And it is reserved in heaven for you. Not, not just for the girl next door, not just for Americans, but for the whole world. It is reserved in heaven for you. I can remember one time when Billy was a little boy, and we were getting ready to go away for a weekend, and um, I was trying to prepare him for the babysitter that was coming to keep all four kids. Have you ever done that? And Billy was in his toddler stage, and I just didn't know how Billy would respond. So we had gotten up early, and he was outside, and it was so it was early, so there were still stars outside. And he ran out in the springtime and said, Mommy, come look at these stars. And that's the beautiful thing about children. You miss so much. If you don't have children, we live so fast, and you see the stars and the caterpillars and all kinds of things when they slow us down to see the world. So I went out to look, and I had been praying about how to prepare him for my leaving. 
So we were looking at the stars and all of a sudden I thought, oh, this is a perfect thing. So we came back in and he was on a little rocking horse there we had kept in the living room. And he was riding the rocking horse and I said, Billy, I said, Mommy and Daddy are getting ready to go. But do you know those stars we saw in the sky? I said, Honey, do you know what? Jesus is preparing a crown for you and he is he is going to know what you've done that pleases him and what doesn't. And I'm and there he will put stars in your crown for all those things that you do that please him. And I went through this whole little spiel about how it was important to obey Jesus and that Jesus knew when he did and he would get stars in his crown and finish my little treatise on crowns and stars. And he kept rocking his horse and said, well, I don't want a crown. (laughs) And I just thought, oh. So I I thought he hasn't understood. Everybody wants to. So I went through it all again and he just kept rocking his horse and he said, mommy, I still don't want a crown. And I looked at him just aghast, and I said, well, Billy, what do you want? He said, when I get to heaven, I want Jesus to put all my stars in my cowboy hat. (laughs) And I thought today when I was going over that, I thought, he has a place reserved for you. And crowns may not speak to you. Cowboy hats may speak to you. And Jesus has, it isn't one that's a cookie cutter. God deals with you and me just the way he made you and me. He is not the one that numbs us or clumps us all together. There are no clones in God's kingdom. There's an individualization that is a place in his heart that is just for you. And if you and I aren't walking in full surrender and obedience, there's a lonely place in his heart. So God has a place for you. And it says he can keep us. We don't have to live backslidden, depressed, down in the dumps life. There is victory and power in the blood of the Lamb. And he can keep you and I. So a hundred years from now, we're still kept by his presence. And I'm claiming that not only he can keep us, but he can keep those we love. And those we're responsible for to say, Jesus, I stand in the gap. That you can keep me and you can keep those I love. That the enemy doesn't have to have everybody he wants. That God can move in and make a difference. So those are some of the things. How is this made possible that you and I are born again? The foundation stone for holiness of heart is that we have entered into a love relationship with him. And we know his cleansing blood has been applied to the sins in our heart. Now I remember when it happened to me. I was a 12-year-old little girl. And Jesus, I went to a camp. And I lived in a Christian home. But I knew there were things in my life that were not what they should be. And one was my horrible, awful, terrible temper. Ooh. I got so mad one time at my sister Susie. I picked her up. And literally, she was a baby. And I threw her. She was two years old. Threw her out of my room. And God said to me, You need something, Beth. I thought, oh, I do. And so I went to this camp and a Baptist preacher spoke and he said, you need to let Jesus come in. And I was under such conviction for sin. Have you ever been under conviction for sin? Oh, it's a gift from God. I pray you'd go all over Wilmore. We'd have conviction, Holy Ghost conviction for sin. And I couldn't bear it. And I went back to my room and I felt every sin I'd ever committed. And there were a lot. <laughs> and I remember a counselor who was sensitive to the Spirit followed me back and said, Could I help you? And I thought it was a kid. And I just said, No, nobody can help me, mad as could be. And then I turned around and just started weeping. And she talked to me and she said, you can let Jesus come in and set you free. You do not have to live like this. God can set you free. And I didn't believe her. And then after I sobbed and sobbed and sobbed, finally she said, pray. Tell him what you've told me. And do you know he came in? He came in so real. And my life was never the same. And if he was so real that night, the joy was so sweet in his presence. I woke up everybody in my cabin to tell him, Jesus has come. Jesus has touched my heart. But do you know what? That is the foundation of our faith. The question is, has Jesus touched your heart? Do you know him as your Savior? 
Has he dealt with the sin question in your life? He wants to set us free. He doesn't want us to live below our privileges. We can be born again. So that it says we need to be born again. The foundation for our faith is to be born again. But then there's something more. Because God is not, God has more for us than just the beginning. That is the beginning. He says, therefore, in verse 13, gird up the loins of your mind. What does that mean? Prepare your minds for action. Get your minds ready for work. I love, love, love that passage of scripture. Do you know what God is saying to you and I? God relates to us as whole people. And you do not check your brain at the door when you enter into a love relationship with the eternal God. What God does is he maximizes and he begins to help us to get out of our little myopic perspective. And God begins to work in our minds and in our hearts by his Holy Spirit. And God is not asking you or calling into you into a relationship where you check your brain at the door as you enter into a relationship with God. God is calling you and I into a relationship with himself where he says, gird up your minds for action. And I am a little bit weary of religion where they say, check your mind at the door and just enter into all kinds of signs and manifestations where you don't even know what's going on. And I don't see any biblical basis for that. God says, gird your minds for action. Get your minds ready to think. And let us, because what happens that really touches me is when something happens in my mind where I begin to settle the will question and the sin question and begin to choose God's way. And it cannot be superimposed upon me by an eternal God. He doesn't work that way. He will come through your mind and you and I have to decide whether we will choose to follow him. So he said, and God works in partnership with us. It says that God, gird up your minds for action. There are some things the eternal God has done for our salvation. There are some things he has done to make you and I holy. But there are some things that you and I must do. And we can see it in the natural realm. And it helps us in a spiritual realm. God provides the sun. He provides the rain. He provides the soil. But it, it works in partnership with a farmer who will cultivate the land, who will put down the fertilizer, and who will put the seed in the ground, then who will, and who will put in irrigation, and then work and cultivate the crop, and then the harvest comes. God puts some things that he does, but some things you and I must do. That's why we need to have our minds in action so that we gird our minds with action and he says and rest your hope fully on the grace that is to be given to you through Christ Jesus as obedient children not conformed yourselves to the former lusts as your ignorance God wants to work in your life and in my life and he wants to work in your mind and your heart so that you begin to make God choices and you begin to think through in your life what is God saying to me and the end of this chapter is on the incredible importance of the word of God in the life of the believer we're doing a whole lesson on it next week that God's going to speak to you and I through the power of his word and if there is anything that is coming into your life that is not in accordance with the word of God flee from it run as far away from it as you can there's great emphasis in our evangelical culture today to have give me quick faith and quick grace and we are crazy about signs and manifestations and God says no it's not there it's in Jesus himself and it's not in the manifestations it is in a walk with God and it is a costly walk and it is a walk that will cost you your self-will. And we don't want that. We want all the blessings and we want all the pizzazz. But we don't want a broken heart that walks with the eternal God and makes a difference in a broken world. And God is looking for women today who say, Lord, I don't want the pablum. I want you. I don't want the fizzies. I want you. But there are not many. There are not many. And Jesus can turn the world upside down if he can get you and I so we're serious and say, Jesus, I have come to the place. I don't want your gifts. There's a longing in my heart for you. And so he says, get rid of the 
way you lived in your former ignorance when you were driven by your own lust. The lust of I need to look pretty. The lust I need to look good. The lust I need to be at the top of the pile. The lust that I need to succeed. The just lust. Lust for this man or that man. Lust in the novels we read. Lust in the things we watch on television. He said you can't live that way anymore. Because there's something that has happened in your heart. You have entered into a love relationship with the eternal God. And you cannot live there anymore. Because he said, I am calling you to holiness of heart. And what does holiness of heart mean? Holiness of heart means just as he has called you as holy, so be holy in all you do. Because it is written, be holy for I am holy. And you say, how do we get holy? Because every, there's something inside my heart, even if I am saved. Even if a God did meet me at 12 in that camp, and I forever know he met me. My life has been different. It wasn't long before in my own life something happened, and there were things in me that still began to come out. And I thought, this isn't the way I should be living. Why am I living like that? And I can remember I went through my teens and I'd be up in the morning and down in the evening. And up and down and up. Sometimes loved people, sometimes hated them. Sometimes was sweet, sometimes was mean as a snake. I mean, and, my, and then I'd go back and I'd confess and I'd try again. And it was this roller coaster kind of existence. And one day at 18 I said, Jesus, pardon me, but if this is all you can do for me, this is pitiful. I'd rather just be a downright pagan than just live like this. Because I have no power of victory in my life over sin. It's just like there's something inside me that sin masters me instead of you mastering sin in my life. So I began to go to the Word. And I began to hear the preaching. And that's what it's about. Holiness of heart is where God comes in and deals with the sin question. The root of sin in your heart and my heart. And so He gives us the... He and ca- enables us so that we are he deals with the sin in my life it doesn't mean we never sin again but the basic issue of whether i will sin or not he takes away the longing and desire for it so that we begin to have a longing and desire for jesus christ in dimensions we've never known before the word took it takes on new power and there is a freedom in our life because we have dealt with sin And Jesus, we cannot relate to a holy God with sin in our life. We need to give it to him. And we need to surrender it. I prayed just recently with somebody. And their life was in an absolute mess, 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 mess. And I I sat there and I talked to him. I said, listen, Jesus can change your situation. Will you let him? And he said, no, I will not let go of my hatred. He said, there's murder in my heart and I won't let go of it. I don't want to let go of it. He said, I just won't let it go. And I said, God could do anything, could transform you in the whole situation if you let go of that hatred in your heart. He said, I won't. I won't. And I think you and I cover over our sin and we cover over things in our lives that we've lived with for a hundred years and we refuse to deal with. And God is saying this today, I am calling you to holiness of heart and I am calling you to a love relationship with me so that you love me first, heart, mind, soul, body, and spirit. And so that out of that love relationship, there's a passion for Jesus that transcends any other passion in your life. And it is no longer a question of will I obey or won't I obey. It is Jesus, what is your will today? I long to do your will. Help me, strengthen me, enable me to do your will. Are you living there? Are you living there? I I read a book this week by... um, I read there last week by one of the women that worked with Amy Carmichael. I I keep referring to her because I think it helps to get models, women models. And Amy's helped me and Rosalind Goforth and um, some of these women that have walked with God. The men help me sometimes, but the women help me a little more. And it's like they're a model. They've walked the walk with him and they've walked their whole life. And they've been kept by the power of his name. And this was one of the women that worked with Amy, and she wrote this book. And she said that she, and they, they had this, they took care of these um, children that were being sold 
and used for um, child prostitution and pornography in India. And um, so they had a whole orphanage full of these children. And they said they were working with the older girls. And this missionary's name was Mary Booth. And she said, I went at night and we had morning devotions and we divided up the family according to the age level because we had so many children. And so I had the older children that had been at Donover, the place where they lived a long time. And she said, we went through all the motions. She said they were, they sat there, they knew their verses. They knew where all the places were in scripture. They looked like Christians. They had all the Christian talk. But she said as we sat there having our morning devotions together, she said they were as dead as they could be. She said they looked like they knew God. They talked like they knew God. But she said there was no stirring of God in their heart and there was a total self-absorption in their lives. And she said, I said, Jesus has all our labor come to this? All our laid down love, the literal sacrificing of our lives come to this? These girls who've been saved from so much and yet it's like, well, ho-hum, I deserve this only so much more. And she said, "I I sat there and my heart was grieved. And then I said, Jesus, and I began to pray. Lord, revive us again. Touch us again. Touch these 20 girls again. She said, the next day I came, and I said, the lesson for this morning, and she said, the clear voice came that what we were to emphasize was repent. Repentance. Do you know the next thing to holiness of heart? You and I need to be saved But then you and I need to come to a place where we confess our sins and the things that are blocking us from walking with God. And if we cannot even sit here and think of what they would be, we need to say, Jesus, would you show me my heart and that that is keeping me from a love relationship with you? And she said, I said to them, I want you to pray that God would give, help you to see if there's anything in your heart that is keeping you from walking with God. So you don't just look like a Christian, but you really are. So that she said, and it goes on to say, you have a father who judges each one impartially. He judges us impartially because the standards set in the holiness of his character. And you say, well, it's my time of the month. That's why I'm screaming. It's my, it's this. Lord, you'd scream too if you had more month than money. Lord, you don't know what my husband's like. You don't know what I'm ha- facing with that ADD child. Lord, you just don't know. There's justification for the way I'm living. And Lord, you've just given me a hard lot and it's all your fault anyway. And God judges impartially. And God comes and the standard is set and not one of us can live it. But you and I have to get to the place we're willing to confess our sins and say, Lord, I have got sin blocking my life and I need to let it go. And then let God bring it to our heart. She said it wasn't too long before those girls, they began to pray that. And this one, one little girl came and stood when she was doing the gardening and came and said, Miss Mary, she said, And she went through a litany of things that God had showed her about her life. And then a litany of things that she needed to make right. She had stolen this. She had lied to this one. She had done this. And she said she had to go back and she was willing to go back and not only confess her sins to Jesus, but confess them to Mary and then to go back and make things right. When you and I begin to make restitution, it begins to mean there is seriousness in our hearts to seek God. And it means that God is beginning to deal with the sin among all sins, which is my pride and your pride, I suspect. The thing that keeps us from what God's got for us is we're proud. 
and will say, well, I'll just pray in secret to Jesus. He'll understand. And you know what? He does understand, but I notice in my life I don't get free until I'm willing to humble myself and come to one other person or a few other people and say, do you know what? I am fighting in this area and I cannot get victory. I need Jesus' cleansing blood to set me free. He says, knowing that you were not redeemed with corruptible things such as silver and gold from your aimless conduct but with the precious blood of Jesus Christ there's nothing that can set you free no silver no gold there's nothing that can set me free that can meet the emptiness that's in our hearts from the life handed down from our fathers there's an emptiness there it's not in a new house it's not in a high paying job it's not in dimple darling children it's not in a marvelous romantic marriage none of those things if God gave you every single one of them there would Jesus shed for us and he said but with the precious blood of Jesus a lamb without blemish he is the one that can meet us. And do you know what holiness of heart is? It is entering into a love relationship with Jesus where he becomes the love of your heart. And it's not working for him. We recognize and say, Jesus, I can't live the holy life. I can't obey. I can't not lose my cool. Will you come in and do it for me? And that's where the power of the Holy Spirit comes in. Where it's an emptying out of who? Of my self-will. And a coming in of the Holy Spirit to enable us to live the way Jesus longs for us to live. So it's not what I do for God. It's what Jesus does by his precious blood in your life and in my life. So he says, he, this was done... This was all foreordained before the foundation of the world. <laughs> it's all in place. The question is, will we receive him? The question is, will we let Jesus do something in our hearts? The question is, will we deal thoroughly with sin? The question is, will we let God set us free and begin to make us holy people after his own heart? It wasn't um another one of the books that has been very meaningful in my life is How I Know God Answers Prayer by Rosalind Goforth. And in it she said she had been a pioneer missionary with um her husband Jonathan in the interior of China. And it re and they'd had ten children and um she had six had lived to maturity and uh, she had literally done pioneer evangelism with those children all over China. She had lived for God flat out. She'd given up everything for him. And every place they went with those children they lived a month at a time and he would preach to the men, she'd preach to the ladies. A church was birthed. And um, this was before communism came in. But you know, she was 40 years of age. And before her last furlough, before she came home, she was sitting in her home. And there were two Chinese people on the other side. And they began to talk about Rosalind. And she heard them. Just on the other side of the wall, there were thin walls. And they went through. They said, she loves us. And she knows our language. And she's willing to sacrifice for us. And she's an excellent preacher of the gospel. But said, oh, if she would only live more as she preaches. She can get so angry. She can be so irritable. She can be so self-centered. And then they went to a very faithful account of Rosalind Goforth's condition and she said I sat there and I thought I can't even take issue with it every single thing they say is true 
And she said, I went and threw myself down on the bed and I said, oh Jesus, I'm willing to work for you. I've given up everything for you. You're even bearing fruit out of my life. But there's something in my heart that's not holy. Can you not do something for me? And she said it was a while. And I came home and I went to a conference of Niagara on the Lake. And she said it was so beautiful. I was sitting out by the lake and it was so beautiful. I thought I won't even go in. But she said I was ever been there. <laughs> she said I went in though and sat down. And he began to say, the preacher, G. Campbell Morgan, said, Jesus can give you victory over sin in your life if you let him. And the whole message was on victory. And she said, Lord, that's what I want. That's what I want. And she said, I sat there. And they said, does anybody have a need? And she said, well, I'm not raising my hand, Lord, because you know my husband is famous missionary, and I'm a missionary. How many years? 20-some years. Lord, I'm not going to say I have a need. Just you know it, and I knew it. And he said, you're a liar. <laughs> and so he said, is there anybody that wants God to do something new and give them victory in their hearts over sin? And that little fan went up, and she said, Jesus, yes, yes. Yes. And she said, she went out and she, they went down and prayed. And she said, Lord, she confessed. She said, and she shared. And she said, Lord, I need a new, I need a deeper touch. I need your Holy Spirit to come in and cleanse and purify my motivation, my heart, my spirit, and let it be the sin be burnt up and the white hot fire of Jesus' love be put in. So out of my life comes you and not Rosalind. And she said, I prayed. And she said, I, I left the conference and my teenage son was sick. And I said to him, I said, let me read you from the little, this little book. And she said, I was reading The Life That Wins by G. Campbell Morgan. And she said, I got to one part where he said, Holiness of life is Jesus himself. Jesus coming into you and you giving him all of you for all of him. And letting him deal with the sin question in your life. And letting him cleanse and purify your heart and your life so that you were all his. And that the life you live is led by Jesus in your life through the power of his Holy Spirit. And she said, as I read that, I thought, it's Jesus himself. <laughs> and she said, it just flowed over my heart. And there was an inner witness that he had received me. And she said the next 20, rest of my life, she said, were lived and the only word I could give you to describe it was resting. He took all the struggle out. I didn't have to handle it. I rested in him. And he lived it out through me. And my all I needed to do was just love him. And be available to him. And just love him. I've got on my wall at my house. What is the chief end of women? <laughs> and men too. It's to love God. And enjoy him forever. It's from the Westminster Confession. Sometimes in the busyness of my life. I get to working for Jesus. And then I realize. No. It's not my work for God. It's loving Him and letting, enjoying Him and that there's an overflow of that love. That's what it means to walk with God. That's when we're enabled to be holy. 
because he does it through us and for us by his precious Holy Spirit and he deals with things that hurt his heart and he does it for us but we have to give him permission and we have the option just like that fella did I prayed with we have the option to say no I won't surrender I'm going to hold on to that anger and I won't ever let it go and we will go straight to hell with it or we can say Jesus I'm so angry and so full of unforgiveness I can't even forgive I don't even want to forgive but Lord I give you permission to begin to begin to soften my heart that there's even a capacity from in my heart to long for you to come in and remove that anger and that unforgiveness or that lust or that addiction or that affair or whatever you're dealing with in your life that needs to go. Jesus is talking to us today. He says, just as he has called you as holy, so be holy in all you do. For it is written, be holy, for I am holy. We can't do it, but he can. Last night, Susanna came home from Marines in the youth group. And she said, Mommy, I read the best story. And I said, and I think it's what we should close with today. She said, there was a little boy who was very short for his age, and he was in elementary school. And um, he wasn't, no one paid any attention to him. He wasn't particularly liked by the children. He was very much a little loner, even though he didn't want to be. He just wasn't in the inner group. Well, Valentine's, all the kids would come home from school, all running ahead, and then would drag in her little fella. And so she said that she was, um, Valentine's Day was coming. And he got the idea. He said, Mommy, I'm going to make Valentine's for every single child in my class. And in her mother heart, she thought, oh, I wonder if he'll even have any Valentine's. And she was in pain over him. And he did. They, he got, she got him all this stuff and he handmade Valentine's. And he had, he just worked on him, worked on him, worked on him a week. And so um, he took him to school and she prayed all day. And then she thought, I'm going to make cookies so that when he comes home, he won't be devastated. Maybe that'll comfort his heart. And so, sure enough, the end of the day came. That mama was waiting there and waiting to hear. And all the children ran on ahead. And she saw them with their little bags of valentines. And then she saw her little boy coming up the walk, just as happy as he could be. Oh, and she said, God, you moved in. And she was so excited. And she, he came in. And he ran in and threw his arms around her. And he said, Mommy, guess what? I made 32 Valentines. And there were exactly 32 children in my class. I didn't miss a one. I didn't miss a one. I had one for everyone to let them know that I was their friend. And then she said, she looked down. And he seemed thrilled. And he started eating the cookies. And she looked in his little bag when he wasn't looking. And she didn't see lots of Valentines. She saw one, a Xerox copy of a Valentine from his teacher. And her heart broke. And then she thought, he doesn't even know because he's so full of giving love. He doesn't even know he hasn't received it back. And do you know what quickened my heart last night as Susanna told me that and I was cooking supper? That is a picture of Jesus. He is Jesus is God's valentine for a lost world. He has given love. He has lived so much. He laid down his life. 
He shed his blood for you and I. He longs to be our friend. He longs to enter into your situation and mine. He longs to take care of you. He longs to provide for you and I. There is nothing so little that Jesus does not want to come and work on your behalf to provide for, to take care of. But he cannot come if we are not clean and if we do not open our hearts to him. But just like this little band of missionaries, if we say, Jesus, we are trying to get to you, but we're just confronted on every side. Jesus, come, please meet us. He will do, he will move heaven and earth to get to your heart and to meet you. But the question is, he's like the little boy with the valentines offering his love and we're like the little children that never return it and run our way and never realize what God's done would there be one this morning that say I'm just tired of living up and down I'm tired of sometimes having the victory but not would there be just one to say I sure would like Jesus to set me free in new ways. I sure would like Jesus to make me holy after his own heart. Even begin to work in my reactions as well as my actions. Do you know it's available? It's all provided since before the foundation of the earth. It is all provided through the precious blood of Jesus the lamb without blemish blemish or defect for you for you even for me the question is will we receive it today we don't have to wait a million years today is God's day of salvation will you let him make you and I holy not by any self entrance any self effort but by his Holy Spirit. Let's pray. Oh Jesus, we pray today we would see you in all your love for us, that you were willing to shed your precious blood for me, for us, that we might know you, that we might fellowship with you, that we might love you. Oh God, we just plead the blood today that you might soften our hearts and that we might enter into that love relationship with you. That we love you heart, mind, soul, and body. In Jesus' name.